Welcome to this event in the 2020 Portobello Book Festival. My name is May Shaw and I'm a member of the organising group. The festival is organised annually by a local group of enthusiastic readers and writers in conjunction with and in support of the local public library. Books featured can be found at the Portobello Bookshop. I would like to thank today's contributors for their willingness to participate in this reconfigured festival. Thank you for joining us and we hope you enjoy it. Hi, I'm Edward Ross and I'm a local comic book artist. I'm really pleased to be at Portobello Book Festival today to talk about my new graphic novel, Gamish, A Graphic History of Gaming, which is out on November 5th. The book is a sort of love letter to the history of games. It takes in a huge variety of games, old and new, to uncover the history of video games. Hopefully in those pages you're going to find examples of games you've not heard of and might want to play, but also it will shed new light on games you're familiar with or might have played lots of times. More than a history, I wanted this book to explore what is it about games that makes them so special? What makes them compulsive? What draws us in? How do we become immersed in games? I wanted alongside that to discuss some of the debates that surround games in terms of video game violence and video game addiction, which are concern a lot of people, and looking at some of the more recent studies surrounding those themes. But most of all, I wanted to see how games can have this really profound effect on us. How do they allow us to better understand ourselves, our bodies? How do they better allow us to, to get to grips with the world around us? And so the first part of this book takes in the first 10,000 years of human civilization, during which time board games evolved alongside us. And it brings us up to this point at the end of World War II, where all the pieces were in place for the first video games to be invented. And that's where this reading is going to start today. I hope you enjoy it. 1939. Hitler's Nazi Reich is storming across Europe. Under the looming threat of an atrocity yet to come, the Polish Cipher Bureau delivers a gift to their allies in France and Britain, a copy of the German Enigma machine. Bletchley Park, England. A promising young mathematician tasked with cracking the German's codes, Alan Turing could see the Enigma machine was a brilliant device. A portable box about as big as a typewriter, the machine allowed its user to type out a message and see it translated into code in real time. Under the lid, a series of electromagnetic cogs and rotors would click into action, converting each letter into a different one. On the open airwaves, these messages were ripe for intercept, but to anyone without the Enigma and its current cipher key, they were meaningless. With a new key chosen every day from 159 quintillion different options, the Germans were certain they had produced an unbreakable system. For Alan Turing, who had been enraptured by puzzles and chess since childhood, the Enigma code promised to be the greatest puzzle he could ask for. The Nazis' code was far too complex to calculate with human brain power alone, and so Turing and the team at Bletchley Park turned to the rudimentary computer technology of the era to help. Working day and night, the team constructed their bomb, a computer whose sole purpose was to root out the current cipher key. The machine was massive, weighing in at around a ton, but it worked. What would have taken teams of human cryptographers months to compute, the bomb could help decipher in about a day. The game was up. The world's toughest puzzle had been cracked. Soon, multiple bombs were in action, operated by teams of female codebreakers who worked day and night to keep them running, praying their work would turn the tide of war. After the war, Turing was drawn to a new puzzle. What else might computers be capable of? Could one make a machine which would answer questions put to it in such a way that it would not be possible to distinguish the answers from those of a man? Could one make a machine which would have feelings as you and I have? Turing began to envision a future of machine intelligence far beyond what these room-sized behemoths were currently capable of. But in training a computer to think, where to begin? In the ancient game of chess, Turing believed he had found his answer. Despite the ever-increasing size and power of computers at the time, Turing knew that programming a computer to calculate every possible move in chess was simply impossible. 
looking even three moves ahead would lead to nearly two billion possibilities. After four moves, it would be over two trillion. Simply put, there are more possible moves in chess than there are atoms in the known universe. It was the perfect problem. Instead of bulldozing an opponent with sheer calculation, a chess program would need to think tactically about the game, to assess the board with intelligence. With his wartime colleague David Champernown, he got to work. By 1952, their program, named Turochamp, was complete. Too complex to run on contemporary computers, Turing tested it by running the program himself, doing the calculations by hand. It was a partial success, about as good as a beginner, but history had still been made. Over the coming years, programmers and engineers would use games to test the limits of their machines and develop their intelligence. At IBM, Arthur Samuel turned to checkers for his pioneering experiments in machine learning. Again limited by the amount of memory and computing power available to him, Samuel taught his program to prune off less profitable options, leaving behind a smaller set to thoroughly compute. By 1955, Samuel's program was capable of memorizing games and learning from its mistakes, able to play against itself to learn faster than a human ever could. Thinking, learning machines. It would only be a matter of time before they could outsmart and defeat a skilled human player. By the 1950s, computers had begun to enter the public consciousness. And what better way to show off their potential than with a game? At the Canadian National Exhibit in 1950, the curtain was raised on Bertie the Brain, a computer designed to play tic-tac-toe with the public. The 1951 Festival of Britain featured Nimrod, a monstrous computer capable of playing the ancient game of Nim. And in 1958, William Higginbotham's Tennis for Two delighted the crowds at his lab's open day, its fast-paced play displayed on a simple oscilloscope. These primitive video games would prove irresistible to those lucky enough to encounter them. As Turing himself noted on Nimrod's appearance in Germany, the Germans had never seen anything like it and came to see it in their thousands. So much so, in fact, that on the first day of the show, it was necessary to call out special police to control the crowds. To the dismay of the scientists presenting these computers, audiences were far more interested in the fun of it than what was going on under the hood. And because the labs that created them were unable to appreciate their historical significance, one by one these games were dismantled, their parts put to work on far more worthy projects. 1961, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. The PDP-1 arrives from Digital Equipment Corporation, $120,000 of cutting edge technology packed into a unit the size of a large car. For the professors of MIT, this machine is the perfect instrument for mathematical formulas and scientific inquiries. Serious work for a serious machine. But for the ragtag group of young students in the Tech Model Railroad Club, this machine represents something very different. They aren't the buttoned-down academics that their professors are. They're hackers, and the PDP-1 was built for them. With the new computer installed, the first thing they do is rip out its insides to see how it works, tweaking hardware and writing software to bend the machine to their will. Before long, the PDP-1 is playing chess and synthesized back fugues, being used to map the night sky and create Mayan calendars. Like our Neolithic ancestors, these students are driven by a desire to play. They play to discover, bending the rules to reveal new possibilities. Because a computer shouldn't just crunch numbers, it should dance and sing and play. The PDP-1 beckons college dropout Steve Russell. It's the height of the space race, and for a young man working in artificial intelligence and obsessed with sci-fi novels and bad movies, the future seems closer than ever. He wants the glory of the greatest hack. He's seen chess, he's seen checkers, but what about a game of speed and skill, a roaring space epic on this sci-fi screen? Space war. The idea sticks, and after months of gentle prodding by his colleagues, Russell sits down to make his vision a reality. 
Days of coding turn into months. Christmas comes and goes. A new year dawns and still Russell codes. His game punched bit by bit into the PDP-1's ticker tape memory. By February 1962, it's playable. Russell's friends gather around the screen. The game begins. An art form has been born. Soon, a ragtag development team forms around the game, the first of its kind. Dan Edwards adds a sun to the middle of the screen, a spot of light that drags hapless ships towards a delicious fiery fate. Fellow hacker Peter Sampson retools his expensive planetarium program, creating a faithful representation of the night sky as a backdrop to the action. With long hours of gaming taking their toll, Alan Kotok and Bob Saunders raid the Tech Model Railroad Club rooms to scavenge parts, cludging together two controllers out of wood, wire and masonite before jumping back into the game. As word spreads beyond the campus, copies pass to other PDP-1 users to play with. It becomes an obsession, a late-night routine so all-consuming that at IBM, the game is banned. Journalist Stuart Brand is witnessing a revolution. He says, They were out of their bodies on this game that they'd created out of nothing. It was the only way to describe it. They were having an out-of-body experience, and up until that time, the only out-of-body experiences I'd seen were drugs. Like chess more than a thousand years earlier, the game spreads like a virus, a thousand times faster, a game burning like a sun. By the 1970s, Space Wars Fire was still burning. In Rolling Stone, Stuart Brand declared he'd seen an art form waiting for artists, a consciousness form waiting for mystics. At Stanford, electrical engineering student Bill Pitt introduced the game to his friend Hugh Tuck. They had a brilliant idea. With the release of the much more affordable PDP-11 in 1969, they got to work assembling a prototype coin-operated space war cabinet, renaming it Galaxy Game in the process. However, they weren't the only ones with big ideas. In California, Nolan Bushnell and Ted Dabney were already working on their own space war clone. Realizing that using existing computers of the time would be too expensive, they hit upon the idea of creating dedicated circuits to run the game on. Housed in a sleek, futuristic cabinet, Computer Space's cheap circuitry meant it could be sold at a fraction of the cost of Pitt's and Tuck's game. In late 1971, within months of each other, Galaxy Game and Computer Space were released to the public. At Stanford's Student Union, Galaxy Game's single prototype unit drew fascinated crowds. As Pitts put it, at the time, a game like that was just magical, to see these little things that you could steer and fire torpedoes. But at 10 cents a game, it was going to take a long time for the pair to make back their $20,000 investment. Bushnell and Dabney's game was somewhat more successful. Though complex to control, the game was a hit with kids and students, a minor commercial success. But these two competing teams weren't alone in their ambition, since as far back as the early 1950s, inventor and engineer Ralph Baer had been working to find a way to let people play games on their TV. Well ahead of his time, it wouldn't be until the late 1960s that technology would catch up with his vision. Working with TV company Magnavox, Bayer created the Odyssey, a revolutionary home console capable of playing 12 inbuilt games, including ping pong and shooting gallery. By 1972, it was almost ready for release. Spurred on by their initial success, Bushnell and Dabney decided to take the next step, forming the first dedicated video game company in June 1972. Having seen a demonstration of the Magnafox Odyssey, Bushnell set their first employee, Al Alcorn, the task of recreating Bear's ping pong game for the arcade market. A gifted engineer, Alcorn got to work tweaking the idea and fine tuning circuitry as Ted Dabney assembled the cabinet. The prototype ready, they dropped Pong off at a local bar and waited. A call came in a few weeks later. Their machine was broken. Arriving at Andy Capp's tavern, Alcorn pried open the jammed coin box. The game was a hit. 
Atari had tapped into something wonderful. Pong snared players like a bear trap. But why? Like Space War more than a decade earlier, Pong gave players the delicious sensation of flow. Coined by psychologist Mikhail Sixcent Mikhail, flow is the sensation of skill and mastery that comes from being really good at something difficult. It's mid-game and amidst a furious back and forth, the background noise drains out of the room and you return every shot with perfect precision. That's flow. And with flow comes a clarity elusive in day-to-day -day life. Concentration is so intense that there is no attention left over to think about anything irrelevant or to worry about problems. Self-consciousness disappears and the sense of time becomes distorted. An activity that produces such experiences is so gratifying that people are willing to do it for its own sake with little concern for what they will get out of it. This sensation, this feeling of being at one with the game, is what made players pump in quarter after quarter, losing hours glued to a glowing screen. By 1973, Pong was going global, transcending all language barriers. In Atari's warehouse, an all-female team worked to assemble circuit boards and construct cabinets to meet the demand. By 1974, Atari had sold 8,000 machines and established themselves as the big name in video games. Soon, other games emerged, harnessing this wonderful sensation of flow to compete for the world's spare change. For musician and sociologist David Sudnow, Breakout became an obsession. This slice of super cerebral, crystal clear Silicon Valley eye jazz tapped into something primordial. As he put it, Pam's wet, pulse racing, mouth dry, nerve endings interfaced in nanoseconds, the knob itself throbbing, electronic reflections going straight from my spinal cord. A game was taking him over, mind and body. It wasn't long before he was addicted, playing for hours every day. Just one more game. It wasn't just sud now. Games were taking over everywhere. Simple, addictive, luminous with colour and speed, in 1979, Tomohiro Nishikado's Space Invaders sent shockwaves through Japanese culture. As games historian Tristan Donovan notes, within three months the game had gobbled up so many 100 yen coins it brought Japan to a standstill, preventing people from buying subway tickets and using public telephone boxes. Its invasion of the US was just as huge, cementing Atari's VCS in the home console market and arcades were springing up everywhere. By 1982, there were 13,000 arcades in the US alone, and many machines were sucking down quarters at a rate of $400 a week. In the wake of Space Invaders' success, game designers tried to outdo each other. Asteroids, Galaxian, Defender, each harder, more ferocious. Light strobing in time with the staccato rhythm of electronic noise, the hammering of buttons, the dropping of coins. As the stakes were raised, the glory and pride of a win became more powerful. This emotion of Fiero would prove to be another factor of gaming success. For a quarter, players could tap into the primal sensations of flow and Fiero with ease. A quarter to transcend your body and enter the game space. A quarter to fight battles against human friends and computer foes. A quarter to feel the rush and challenge of victory. As Time magazine put it, video games were blitzing the world. If for one minute you could ignore the novelty of it all, the bright lights and shrill bleeps, you'd see that these games were doing what games had been doing for millennia. Like in our earliest play, these games were giving us a chance to hunt, flee, hide and fight. Like Mancala and Chess, they were bringing people together in friendship and competition. They were giving us a chance to play and a chance to win. These simple qualities were the foundation of the games industry. They were the reason that Space Invaders alone would gobble up 4 billion quarters across the world by 1981. From Space War onwards, game designers could see the power games had over us, and they were now realising they could do more than just target our reflexes and adrenal glands. They could do more than deliver flow and fiero. This art form could be used to tell stories, bring worlds to life and allow us to better understand ourselves and the world we live in. 
I hope you enjoyed that reading. The book's out on November 5th and I hope you consider buying it. You can pre-order it today from the Portobello Bookshop or all good bookshops.